All right. It is an honor. It is an honor and a pleasure to be able to introduce Mo Turner for her PhD defense. Um, Mo, uh, I would say, um, epitomizes what it means to be um, an academic in terms of, of activities that uh, accomplish what she has done over time. Hello. With the sort of science citizenship part of service, um, because that uh, you know, that is what we will miss the most about um, has so um, Mo has served on several search committees in the College of the Environment. She has served um, to improve field safety. She served on dive control committees, um, seminar committees, diversity equity committees. Why do you bring that over, Molly? Are now part of the FHL swag. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. So lasting mark there. Um, so that is a lot of work to do. Um, in addition, deeply uh, involved in the teaching mission of the department um, and the university through Friday Harbor across many levels of um, undergraduate curriculum and including serving as instructor of record for um, a couple of conservation and field classes. Mm -hmm. So, and, you know, students love her and they learn from her. Um, which I feel like in terms of day two, we are all students of well in this instance. <laughs> uh, she also has a wide and varied science toolbox. This includes it also includes next box models, non-normal data, zero included data, multivariate data, all the things that uh, community colleges wrestle with. Um, she has embraced and learned and sometimes thrown away because it wasn't quite right. <laughs> and tried something else, actually, probably yeah. repeatedly thrown yeah. away because it wasn't quite right and mm -hmm. tried something else. Um, in addition, she has picked up skills in um, morphology associated with micro CT scanning um, and has really, I would say, like a new ground of seeing things that no one has seen before uh, in this way. Uh, during her time in grad school, she's co author on five publications. She has also just done a lot of different kinds of things. <laughs> And um, I will just say that what we call her bird chapter <laughs> <laughs> will get short trip. As it is nothing about her. Right <laughs> but I did want to say that the methods that she created for that chapter are now embedded in the citizen science sampling program that is ongoing in Los Washington Department of Natural Resources. So she has left. <laughs> okay, um, I think without further ado, um, let's hear about what Mo has um, learned and <laughs> is after sharing with us. All right, thank you very much, Jen. That was a wonderful introduction. Um, uh, and I think um, sort of the term of dabbled in a lot of different things is just a nice way of saying that I get very easily distracted and like to touch all the science <laughs> fields um, and try my hand at a little bit of everything. Um, and so for today, I'm really just going to focus in on two of the many things that I've uh, had the opportunity to play with um, during my PhD. And as Jen alluded to, um, I uh, have indeed spent some time uh, studying birds the first two years of my PhD, actually, and I think a lot of people um, don't realize that because um, I have a mild obsession with sea stars, and that's mostly what I talk about. Um, so for today, we're going to sort of ignore the feathered one and instead really focus in um, on the, the core sap that's being eaten there. Um, and uh, and this is a sea star. Um, so these guys are benthic predators. Um, they move around uh, on the substrate. Most of them are subtidal. Um, they've got tube feet underneath that they're sort of crawling around. And right at the center um, on the underside, they've got a, a, a big mouth. So they're sort of cruising and eating at the same time. Um, and uh, we see a lot of different ways that they can affect communities. 
um, in terms of what they eat um, and how they sort of their role as, as, a, as a predator. Um, and this particular star is fairly well known um, in the echinoderm world um, and the, uh, the ecological world because of the work that uh, Bob Payne did back in the 60s, um, looking at this particular star. And I'll describe a little bit about why this star is so interesting and important. Um, uh, but uh, one of the things that I'll point out here um, is that uh, where you see sea stars, you see a whole lot of nothing else on the rocks. Um, so these are really voracious predators. They just mow down everything in their way. Um, and they have a real love for, for mussels. Um, and so Bob Payne coined this term, uh, keystone predation, um, uh, back in 1969. Um, and this says that uh, the, the predator can increase diversity by removing a competitive dominant. Um, so I'll walk you through that just a little bit because that's really strong background for, for what my question was with sea stars. Um, so we've got an inner title here um, and we have lots of mussels. Um, and mussels as a competitive dominant um, sessile organism can just sort of outgrow everything. They form these really big thick mats um, and, uh, and they'll just grow their way down. But hopefully you'll notice that it also sort of stops at one point. They don't keep growing up. And that's because in the intertidal zone with the water coming in and out, the higher you are on the intertidal, the less you're in underwater. Um, so it gets warm, you can dry out. The, the conditions get pretty extreme. Um, and so you sort of have this upper limit set by those abiotic factors. Um, and if there was nothing else out there, mussels would just sort of grow their way down. But we know that there is something else out there. We've got these voracious predators, these sea stars, um, while, while slow, <laughs> do work their way around um, and, and sort of mow down these mussels. They love the mussels. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we end up with is this band of mussels because uh, similar to the mussels, Pisaster also has an upper limit. Um, and so it can't move, it, it can't uh, sort of, uh, it, it can't deal with the upper temperatures much higher than this. So we've got a nice band of mussels here. And what that does is it opens up space for other sessile organisms to come in. So that's that keystone predation, removing a competitive dominant to allow for other species to come in. Um, and we see this really clearly on the outer coast. So up here, we've got this band of barnacles then we have this big thick band of mussels right here and you can see that the sea stars go right up to that line and they are just chowing down. Um, but uh, this image and a lot of this sort of principle is applied primarily to the outer coast. Um, this is where we have really wave exposed areas. This is where the mussels do particularly well. Um, and where we are here in the inner waters of the Salish Sea, we don't have that strong wave exposure and these big mussel beds. Um, but we do have pisaster. So I wanted to sort of understand the role that pisaster is playing as a predator um, in these areas, given that we don't have that muscle, um, that muscle component to the keystone, keystone predation. Um, and here's what, our, uh, what some of my sites look like. And so we end up having, a little hard to see, but we've got this sort of barnacle zone right on top. Um, it heads down into this sort of fucus which is a type of um, algae, fucus and barnacle zone, uh, and then we're in sort of the lower waters. Um, but the noticeable thing here is that there aren't those muscle bands. Um, so what I wanted to do in order to understand what they were doing and, and their role, first I needed to establish what are they eating? Um, so we started with a diet study. And so um, one of the really nice things about sea stars and, and looking at what they're eating is that they eat externally. Um, so they push their stomach out of their mouth they sort of digest and dissolve the food outside of their body, and then they bring their stomach back in. And so when I flip over a sea star, I can very clearly see what's happening because I don't have to look inside the animal. Um, so we started walking around at low tide and flipping over every star that we could find and taking a note of where are you in the intertidal zone? What are you eating? Um, how big is it? How big are you? Um, just started taking lots of metrics down. Um, but I very quickly got frustrated because uh, I was only seeing sea stars eating like one in every 10 to 15 stars. And when there's only 20 to 30 stars at a site, it becomes very difficult to make, uh, uh, to be able to say anything about diet if they're not eating anything, um, which also confused me about how anybody else made diet studies about sea stars if they aren't eating that much. Um, so one of my good friends, uh, Hillary Hayford, sort of poked me and reminded me and said, hey, 
these are intertidal organisms and they don't just live out of the water at low tide, they also live underwater when the tide goes up. Um, and so this is uh, uh, my student, Chris Gendry. Um, he did a lot of, uh, he helped me a lot with the surveys and also did some work on his own. Uh, we tried, uh, we attempted to tag sea stars, <laughs> did not work. Um, we also attempted to get them on video moving. That also kind of didn't work. Um, but uh, so while we did do surveys at low tide, we've returned to the same exact spot. And that's Chris again, looking in the same crack, um, but at a higher tide while they're underwater. Um, and let me just describe a little bit about what's going on at this site. Um, so we've got sort of the rock. Oh yeah, that's just cut right off, didn't it? Okay, so uh, two meters, one meter, zero meter, negative one meters in terms of tide height. Um, and uh, all of all three sites that I was able to find uh, the sea star at have this characteristic crevice cut at about zero meters. Um, and I think uh, I'm fairly certain that what's happening there is that um, the sea stars do really well at these sites because they have somewhere to hide at low tide. Um, so you see them at this type of uh, setup more often than you would see them at a place without a crevice. Um, so we've got that crevice. We've got a lower observation limit because once you get too low, the kelp gets really thick and it's just impossible to sort of like flip through it to find sea stars. So we've got a lower limit. We've got a general sort of organization of where the food possibilities are. Um, and uh, there's sort of less food the lower down you are and more food options as you go up the intertidal. And those sea stars are hanging out in that crevice. Um, so as the tide goes up, we were seeing the sea stars not only eating more, but also moving up on the rocks to get to that more prey um, abundant space. And so what that ends up looking like, um, there's just a couple things uh, to take a look at here. But the first is that um, when you're underwater, um, you're eating a lot more often than when you're out of water, which is what I expected after we had flipped over so many stars and couldn't find anything. Um, and that when you're underwater, um, you tend to move out of the crevice, so those upper areas to try and feed. Um, and then I think one of the more important aspects to this is not just that they're eating more, but the proportion of what they're eating is vastly different. Um, so if you only go out at low tide to see what Pisaster is eating, um, it's a lot of larger prey items, um, limpets, gastropods, chitons. Um, and so you have a bit of a skewed sense of what their diet is. Um, whereas if they're underwater, what they're actually doing is sort of going around and mowing down these little barnacles, like little snacks. You're just sort of walking around, grabbing snacks, grabbing snacks until you find that big thing and you hold onto it and you start chewing on it, but it takes a long time. So as the tide goes out and you do a low tide survey, that's what you're capturing is those larger food options. Um, and yeah, so this is just pointing out that most of these, these sort of larger two bars, these are all bar types of barnacles. So there's a much heavier um, proportion of barnacles in their diet than, than previously um, described. And that's uh, apparent in this uh, just comparison of some of the previous diet studies, um, the only previous diet studies that I could find back in the 60s um, with, with the pain and fetter being on the outer coast and um, mozzie being a little bit further inland. Um, so we do see a higher portion of barnacles um, if you're looking at high tide. So now that we've established a better idea of their diet in the area, um, I wanted to be able to ask what is the what what are they doing to the prey community? And so we wanted to answer this by putting out these exclusion cages. Um, so it's a wire mesh cage. Um, and then next to it is a cage control. So the sides were open so predators could get in. And then we had a no cage experiment. In addition, we also wanted to do sort of a disturbance, no disturbance treatment. So if the space was completely clean, yeah. what would the community look like over time? Um, given whether uh, the predator was there or not. Um, this was a rather ambitious project. <laughs> uh, it took us a long time to put it out. Um, I had a ton of help. Um, it was really fun of uh, sort of blow blow torching the rocks a little bit to make it clean. Um, but after a year of sort of surveying, um, very little had happened. Very little had settled, very little had changed. And we very quickly realized that the time scale at which I could answer the question was far beyond a PhD. Um, and so uh, this sort of uh, got, got wrapped up a little early. Um, but as we were cleaning up some of the plots, a really interesting thing popped up in just a handful of them. It's a little hard to see, but 
um, the cage plots. So this one over here, when we pull this one up, is full of muscles, it's tons of muscles. And here's another one here. Every single one of these black dots are muscles. So by excluding predators, um, and in this case, it could have been more than just sea stars. It could have also been some snails and some birds. Um, by excluding sea stars, it's clear that muscles can be here. Um, the larvas in the water, they can settle, um, but due to really high predation, um, we're not seeing that. We're not seeing those uh, muscles really establish as a bed. Um, so just to sort of wrap that one up, um, Pies astrocrasis is a generalist predator. It's eating a lot of different things. Um, and that feeding behavior is changing depending on where you are with the tides. So it's really important for intertidal organisms that we take into account sort of both of those stages of their life. Um, and that's a picture that I actually uh, took in the field. Um, that sea star did not catch that fish, um, <laughs> but it is definitely scavenging on it, which was pretty amazing. That, that like made my week. It was uh, incredible to see. Um, the lack of sea, uh, the lack of mussels in San Juan as a mussel bed uh, suggests that the star is not having that same sort of keystone predation role. Um, and while we couldn't necessarily dig deeper into what that role actually is, um, we can say that um, high predation in the islands um, is preventing these mussels from really establishing as a large bed. Um, and that's really getting into sort of the function of one single star, um, but uh, I would also like to recognize that uh, Pies Astrocratius is not the only sea star. Um, our waters have uh, an incredible number of species with a huge diversity in form, in shape, in size. Um, we have stars at full size that are only about the size of a half dollar to stars that are, you know, meters across, just huge sea stars. Um, and so I wanted to be able to understand a bit more about sort of the connection between form and function. Um, so we see a lot of different shapes. There's spines, there's no spines, there's sort of more fluffy, we've got multiple arms. Um, how does that translate into their role um, as predators in their field? And one of the ways that we can look and compare morphology across these stars is by looking at their endoskeletons. And I've got a whole bunch of them up here um, that folks can take a look at. Um, actually, all of the stars that were scanned are here. Um, and so uh, the skeleton of a sea star um, is just underneath the surface. So if you picture like a knight in shining armor and just put a layer of skin on top of that, that's what you have in terms of armoring in a sea star. Um, it's hollow on the inside. That's where all the organs are hanging out. Um, and so it's protective and it's also sort of a scaffolding, a structure um, to, to help hold form. Um, and while the skeletons, if you've ever sort of seen one at a shop or on the beach or something, while they seem relatively solid, they're actually made up of thousands and thousands of these tiny little um, calcium, uh, uh, calcium carbonate pieces called ossicles. Um, and the shape of those ossicles and how they're arranged um, uh, differs between the different species. And so we wanted to be able to measure these differences across the skeletons and be able to see whether we could correlate those differences to either their phylogenetic relationship or um, their ecological role in the, in, in, the, in the wild. So to do this, to image the stars and to measure them, um, we used a CT scanner um, at Friday Harbor Labs. Um, and uh, I'll just explain the process of how that worked. Um, so the stars are not alive at this point. <laughs> they can't move while they're in the scanner. And so these are fixed in ethanol. Um, we wrapped them up. Um, in cheesecloth and put them in a, in a container that would fit inside the CT scanner, um, which Adam Summers lov lovingly refers to as the burrito. Um, and so we made a bunch of sea star burritos so that we could scan multiple at a time. And what this is doing is taking a series of photos that then we can reconstruct with software, all of those photos together um, to make some 3D models of what the stars look like and, and really see those skeletons. And then I can use additional software to sort of separate them and start to really look at all of the individual pieces. And so what we end up seeing is something like this. Um, so this is Leptosterius. This is the sea star that at about full um, size is only about this big. They're super common in the intertidal around here, um, but 
fairly cryptic. They're the, si they're the color of rocks. <laughs> um, and some of the things that we're seeing, I'll just point out, so we can see some of those individual pieces. Um, there's, there's some rows that I'll point out in a little bit. Um, but one of the other things I want to show is this sort of deep groove that we see in the bottom here. This is referred to as the ambulacral groove. And this is where you would find tube feet um, in a sea star. So if you flipped over sea star and see these tube feet, um, they, they're, they're within this um, ambulacral groove and they can, since it's all articulated skeleton, they can adjust the shape of the ambulacral groove to pull the tube feet in and protect them or open up and let those tube feet out. So the ambulacral groove really has to do with that sort of tube feet protection and support where the rest of the body is sort of scaffolding and protection for the organs and the rest of the body. Um, so we can do this for uh, as many species, uh, basically as, <laughs> I went with as many species as I could find that would fit in the CT scanner. So because it's a micro CT scanner, we can see really fine detail, but it's limited in how big the organisms can get. And since some of our stars can get this big, obviously I can't scan a full-sized adult. And so it really came down to whether or not I could find um, a representative of the species of that size. And with Leptosterius being so small, there were plenty of those. Um, and, uh, and I'll show you some of the other species we were able to find in a second. But um, we can take a look at the ab oral view. So that's sort of the top side of the star that doesn't have the mouth flip it over and take a look at the, at the oral side here. We can also sort of zoom in on different portions. Um, the mouth is a great one to take a look at because that might relate to what they're eating. Um, their, their diet um, might shape uh, what that looks like. Um, and at this view, um, we can see some patterns. Um, we can see sort of how they're arranged but I can't really see the individual ossicles and how they're attached to each other. Um, and so what we did was we, we removed just the tip of an arm about a centimeter long of each species and re-scanned it at a much higher resolution. And now we can see quite a bit more detail. We can see each individual ossicle, we can see all those spines. Um, and we did that for all nine species that we were able to find, whoop, um, all nine species. Um, and uh, first of all, it's just stunning. <laughs> I think they're gorgeous. Um, I was just like, every time we put a new star in, I was just sort of freaking out. Um, they just look amazing. And uh, some of these stars from the outside, I would have never guessed it at how um, the organization turned out, particularly um, this one here. Um, absolutely incredible uh, sea star, sorry, this one. Um, and so there's a couple patterns that we can pull out of this. Um, just by looking, just sort of qualitatively describing, um, we sort of have these three stars here that have this almost sort of smooth texture. They, they don't appear to have any spines. Um, we've got these three stars here that seem to have a more sort of regular single spine um, that's sort of evenly distributed versus these two have these almost like tufts at the end, so you've got like spines on spines. Um, so we're definitely seeing some different morphologies between the species. Um, but if we take that closer look um, at some of the arms and really get into the ossicles, uh, only one of those sort of three smooth looking species is actually smooth. Um, the other two actually have tiny spines or this one was by far the most surprising one that we saw uh, once we got the scan back. It's completely covered in these tiny little bumps top to bottom, and I can't tell you why. I have no idea, <laughs> um, but it's, uh, it's just sort of stunning to see and, and to start thinking about um, what could that be aligned with? Why would you have those types of um, designs? Um, and uh, if we take a look at some others, like these two down here, they actually seem relatively similar, um, sort of the same even pattern. Um, you've got this sort of spine running down the, down the arm, um, sort of similar to this one here. Um, so we can just start looking at this and describing it qualitatively, but I want to find a, uh, but I wanted to figure out a way that we could quantitatively um, compare across these, these different species. So I'm going to use this one in the lower corner as an example um, of the process that I used. 
um, and I'm just going to turn it for the sake of the slide organization. Um, but I used a process called segmentation. So this is a way that we can digitally isolate specific portions of our 3D data. Um, and so here's uh, an example of what that looks like. Um, and so in this case, the ambulacral groove, um, I isolated and, and made it pink. Um, the, the arm itself, sort of that scaffolding, I, I turned green. Um, and then I'll explain the other colors in a second. Um, but this is a full 3D model, right? I can rotate it, I can look at it from all different points of view. Um, and then I can also look down sort of into the arm itself and look at the shape of that ambulacral groove. Um, so now that we can isolate all these different parts um, and, and we can really visualize the, the, uh, the sea star itself, um, I needed to dig into the literature to really understand the, the individual ossicles. Um, and it turns out that uh, they are super well described. <laughs> um, the vocabulary for, for explaining each of these ossicles is, is pretty unreal. Um, each ossicle has its own name um, and has been fairly well described for a series of, of species. Um, but I'm just going to break it down into sort of five, uh, into two regions and then five main types of ossicles. Um, so the two main regions, which I've already sort of alluded to, is that ambulacral groove where the tube feet would be versus the rest of the body wall. Um, the ambulacral groove is made up of two different types of ossicles. Um, this first one here is called the ambulacral ossicle. And again, these are all articulated. Um, so that's one ambulacral ossicle, and this is the second one, and they can bend um, at this pivot point here. Um, and then we have the adambulacrals. Um, and then coming off the adambulacral is, is a spine, and that can be varied between the species. Um, the body wall is made up of three types of three major types of ossicles. Um, the first one is uh, the carinal ossicle, and this is that sort of spine that runs along the central back of the arm, the aboral um, side of the arm. Um, then you've got the marginals down here in yellow, and that's what connects the body wall to the ambulacral groove. Um, because there's a bunch of hollow space between the ambulacral groove and the body wall, and that's where you find the organs. Um, that's where you find the gonads and the digestive system and things like that. Um, and then the tube feet sort of move through in between the ambulacral grooves, um, ambulacral ossicles, and then out the bottom. Um, and then the rest of the body wall is referred to as the reticular ossicles. And again, there's like many types of each of those, but we're going to leave it at this level of organization. Um, in addition to that, we can also have spines, um, but this is not considered a major type of ossicle, um, mostly because these aren't always on every species and they come in a huge variety. Um, you can have multiple spines, you can have spines on every ossicle, you can have no spines at all. Um, the other part as well are what's called pedicellaria. Um, and this is another one that only is found in, a, in just a few groups of sea stars. Um, and pedicellaria are essentially tiny jaws um, that are on the outside of the star um, and they're stocked. So you, there's sort of a tissue stock and then you've got a tiny jaw and they can move around and they're thought to be sort of defensive. So if something lands on top, um, they can sort of snap at things. Um, they can also be anti-fouling. So if something tries to settle, they can move it off. Um, there's great videos of people sort of putting sand on top and you can watch these claws sort of pick a grain of sand and pass it down to sort of unbury itself. Um, so they're pretty impressive, uh, but um, all that the CT scanner is picking out is the actual claws themselves. So it looks like floating pieces, but they're actually on tissue stocks. Um, so now that we've got sort of our major types of ossicles, now we want to start comparing that across the different species. Oh, sorry. Um, there's just an example of a SEM of pedicellaria. Um, they've got, they tend to have teeth. They look nasty. Um, uh, yeah, you can also find those on sea urchins as well. Sea urchins have really crazy ones. Um, okay, so now we want to quantify the armor. How much armor do the sea stars have and how much does that differ between our species? Um, and I can calculate this at the scale of both the whole specimen and then also that arm tip that we pulled off um, to take a closer look. So what I'm showing you right now in this blue is um, the segment that includes the skeleton, the tissue, and the body cavity on the inside. So represents total volume of the star or the, the ray tip 
Ray is another term for arm. I know I've sort of flipped back and forth. I'm trying to train myself to say Ray, even though I say arm. Um, <laughs> so I can take that total volume and ask out of that total volume, how much of it is the skeleton? Um, and so that sort of gets at how much of your body is dedicated to armor. Um, and if we take a look at that data, there we go, a little bit of a delay. Um, I've ordered the stars at the bottom from least armored to most armored. Yeah. There we go. Nice. Um, and so uh, you can end up with stars that have a, a, just a really a surprisingly small amount of their body that's dedicated to armor. And what you end up seeing is um, all of these ossicles that are sort of randomly, uh, well, I guess not so randomly, but evenly spaced out and not necessarily sort of touching or on, the, on each other. So there's tissue and there's muscle in between each, rather than having um, something like leptosterius at the very end um, where they're all sort of connected to each other. They overlap quite a bit and the ossicles themselves are fairly sort of large and hefty in size. And in that case, make up 40% of the body. 40% of the body is just skeleton, um, which is pretty wild. And I would imagine perhaps heavy um, to have to carry around. And so if you're going to be that armored, it's probably for some, a very good reason. Um, so from that sort of total volume, um, we can also ask how much of that skeleton is dedicated to different parts. Um, so how much of it is dedicated to protecting the, uh, the tissue, uh, the tube feet versus um, scaffolding for the arm. And we can do that for all nine species. Oh, this delay, okay. Um, so we can take a look at that organization for all nine species and calculate it. Um, and in addition to those sort of major body regions, I also took out a cross-sectional slice of each arm that's at the width of one repeating unit of ossicles. So I'll use this one as an example because it's nice and clear. Um, we've sort of got one repeating unit here and then another repeating unit here and then another one. So I just picked, I isolated out one of those both for the body wall and the ambulacral groove. And we can take a look at the organization of those as well. So now within the body wall, um, we can see um, major, just vast differences in how they're allocating their skeleton across these bodies. Um, so we've got a couple species like, like this um, Dermasterius imbricata known as the leather star and Mediaster, which have these huge marginal ossicles. Um, not only are they sort of high in surface area, but they're also really thick. So that suggests to me that there's, there's something defensive against something that comes in from the side. Um, and for Dermasterius, at least, these guys specialize on anemones. So it could be that they're trying to prevent um, the tentacles from basically stinging them from the sides as they try and eat their prey. Um, there's a couple stars, uh, Leptosterius, Pisaster, and Evisterius, where we see presence of pedicillaria um, across those three. And we also see a relatively similar sort of design again um, of those uh, sort of large chunky spines um, on just about every ossicle around the body wall. Um, and then we get sort of short, small spines we get these big clusters. This one sort of looks like paintbrushes moving around. Um, we can also look at the ambulacral groove itself and uh, see that we've got sort of thin, tall ones. Um, but remember that they can sort of pivot. So the distance between them doesn't actually indicate, um, it just indicates what position they were in when they were fixed. Um, so now that we can sort of measure different aspects of the star, We've got these different pieces segmented. We can calculate the volumes for each of these pieces. Um, we can start to, to sort of compare what that looks like across species um, and try to ask whether or not the morphology is correlated to phylogenetic uh, relationships or to their ecological traits. Um, and so I used a phylogeny uh, from Lenchenko um, 2017, um, which is the most recent. Um, the echinoderm phylogeny as a lot of invertebrates uh, is changing constantly. So there's a new paper out like every year or so um, that, that makes some adjustments. Um, but the stars that we looked at 
um, fall within four of the seven orders of sea stars. Um, and so we can sort of visually take a look at what that means. Um, and again, those three stars that are morphologically similar are falling within a, a similar order. Um, but, uh, but then you also have um, this sort of polyphyletic or paraphyletic group um, where we have sort of a lot of variation happening. Um, we calculated phylogenet phylogenetic distance from a slightly older paper um, that included all of our species, um, but at the order level, it was still consistent with the new, the new paper. Um, and to measure phylogenetic distance, um, I'll pick sort of these two, for example, um, we measured the horizontal distance between um, their closest ancestor, their closest shared ancestor, um, and uh, graphed this. So we have phylogenetic distance on the x-axis and the morphological distance um, uh, on the y-axis. And each data point is a pairwise comparison between two stars. Um, so we went ahead and plotted that, and we see maybe a little bit of an increase. It's a little scattered, but there seems to be a little bit of a correlation maybe. Um, but if we look a little bit closer at what each of those points are, those three stars that are really tightly um, uh, morphologically and phylogenetically linked um, pair up down here, and they also pair up uh, over here in terms of their comparison to Henricia. And so, so some of the patterns that we're seeing are related, are being driven by this particular tightly grouped um, species. Uh, and then this, this, this other group is another set of really tightly phylogenetically grouped um, stars. So uh, if you are phylogenetically very similar, then you likely have a very similar morphology. But I can't say that much about anything else, given the nine species that we looked at. Um, so we can ask a similar question with ecological traits. Um, and so we looked at what are the stars eating? Um, where are they found? Sand, mud, cobble, bedrock. Um, are they known to be predated on? Um, there's a particular species in our waters that specializes on eating other sea stars. This is Solaster jocini, also known as the king star. Um, and uh, also whether or not you're intertidal, right? We were, when we're thinking about Pisaster and having to deal with the air and the water, you, you likely have some adaptations that might stretch across those species. Um, so we took all of these e ecological traits, oh, and the gulls <laughs> sort of fall within the intertidal category, um, because if you're intertidal, then you're also exposed to the gulls. Um, so since those were so tightly correlated, we just went with the intertidal. We didn't also include gulls, but they're, they're there. <laughs> Um, so we took a look at that data as well, and it's even more scattered than the last one was. Um, again, we're seeing maybe a little bit of a, an increase if you squint. Um, but again, we see that grouping. So if you're really morphologically similar, um, in this case, um, the, those three stars are somewhat ecologically similar um, and very morphologically similar. Um, and so this pattern, again, seems to be driven by that same group of three stars. Um, so to sort of wrap up that one, sorry, the slides are taking a second. There we go. Um, we see some correlation between the stars uh, morphologically to their phylogeny and their ecology. There's definitely something happening there, um, but we would need more stars to understand sort of that, that larger pattern. Um, and again, sort of driven by those three stars that on every level are pretty similar. Um, we looked at a lot, um, I sort of glazed over this because we looked at a lot of different relationships between the different pieces. And um, the one that I think was perhaps more, most interesting is that as you increase in body volume, you sort of decrease in like frilliness. Um, and so you end up having these more blocky um, body walls, uh, ossicles and uh, re reduced spines. And this, um, this was the relationship for all nine species that we looked at. Um, and so I'd be interested to see if this holds as we sort of look at more and more stars. Um, yeah, uh, okay, so to wrap up sort of everything that we've looked at in terms of sea stars, um, for feeding ecology, uh, diet matters, uh, tide level matters when you're thinking about intertidal organisms. So you have to consider both low tide, high tide scenarios um, to get a full image of what's going on with your, your critter. 
Um, and that the lack of bivalves in the San Juans appears to be um, due to high predation. Whether or not that's only sea stars, um, there's a lot of other predators, um, but high predation is definitely keeping them um, from establishing. Um, we see a huge range in skeletal morphology, no spines to lots of spines, low volume um, to 40% of your volume. Um, for really closely related species, we're seeing really tight morphological similarities, um, and uh, there, which indicates there might be some limited flexibility in, in what your organization can be. Uh, and then uh, there are some consistencies in patterning as volume increases. Um, and, uh, you know, I would love to just keep scanning stars <laughs> and throwing them in there and seeing what happens. Um, so with that, I want to plug a couple things. One, open source everything. Um, the software that I use to look at all of this um, is all open source and available. Um, the scans themselves are heading online for people to download and take a look at. Um, so people can play with these data sets as much as they want and any other data set that's up there. Um, the MorphoSource website is a lot of vertebrates right now. <laughs> it's <laughs> mostly vertebrates. And so I want to plug to scan in vertebrates. Um, and that's been somewhat challenging up till recently, particularly with CT scans, because when you think of CT scans, it's like bones and hard things. Um, but there's been some really cool advances on uh, uh, staining in vertebrates and seeing soft tissue. So this is some work I did last summer with a student of mine. Um, and I also think this has some really cool implications, not just for research, but for education. Um, especially now, like having gone through this pandemic and classes moving online and taking a really hands-on invertebrate class and having to move that online, something like 3D models that students can look at and rotate and we can segment out like the digestive system versus the reproductive system and things like that, um, to have those sort of pre-segmented and available to classrooms, um, also for folks that aren't, that don't have, um, access to the ocean and all of these animals the way that we do. Um, so sort of really cool opportunities there that I think um, should be, should be, you know, done. Uh, so with that, I have acknowledgements. I'm going to hold it together. It'll be fine. Um, to my committee, uh, who I know that I am not the easiest person to work with in terms of getting my writing done. Um, <laughs> Uh, but uh, pushes and nudges and lots of help throughout. Um, not only uh, did uh, they help me, but I also had a chance to work with them. Also, Jen came out and worked with me in the field. Um, I went out and worked with Megan on, with some of her stuff. And then uh, one of the coolest things that I did during a PhD <laughs> was go in a submarine with Adam Summers um, out in Friday Harbor Labs. Um, so just really cool opportunities um, that I've gotten to do during my PhD. Um, and then Jen, um, you are just an incredible person. Um, I have been telling some folks lately, but for the last four or five months, maybe, we have been meeting daily, almost daily for about an hour every evening, um, which, yeah, a lot of people are like, oh, God, <laughs> that's terrifying. Um, but it's something that we tried out for a week, and we both just loved it so much, and we were just enjoying it, each other's company and sort of this work hour of sort of work and then catch up and just sort of back and forth with any questions or like what's going on with science. Um, it was just so engaging and so much fun um, that we just kept doing it for months. <laughs> um, and uh, she is just uh, so insightful and has this superpower um, where if you're trying to describe something and you want to glaze over something and not have her notice. Um, <laughs> She sort of hones right into that and sort of pauses and is like, hold on, can you expand on, on that one thing? Um, which at first was fairly intimidating, but uh, I think we're all the better for it. Um, uh, you know, she goes out of her way to make sure everyone is just super comfortable and um, just feels heard. Um, there was one point in my, I think, first year where I was sitting in my office, she just walked in and she was just like, 
I just want to make sure you feel supported <laughs> and I feel good. If you need anything, just let me know. And it was just out of sort of out of the blue. And it just felt really uh, amazing to hear that, um, especially as a first year coming in to just know that sort of that person has your back um, at all times, which she has. Um, so thank you. Um, it's really been uh, really fun. And again, I know I'm difficult, but <laughs> I hope you had fun too. <laughs> um, uh, my family is a bunch of goofballs. Um, a handful of them made it out. My dad and my mom flew out. My little brother just drove up from Portland this morning um, and didn't tell me. Um, and uh, yeah, we, 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 it's just a super tight knit family. We have a lot of fun. We try and get together every year and the pandemic was hard. Um, so it's just, it's, it's so nice to have them here. Um, and I have always been so supported by my parents. They've just let me do, you know, just letting me do exactly what I want to do. Like, I want to go into science. Yes. You want to scuba dive? Yes. Let's do it. Like, what, what do you want to do next? What, what can we do to get you there? Um, and I just can't ask for more. It's just absolutely incredible. Um, and I love them all very much. Um, friends, lab mates, uh, I've been here for seven years, so uh, that means I, I, it's just so many people, and I just kept adding more pictures, and they kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and I just had to stop at some point, um, but there's just so many people. Um, my FHL family, I know there's a bunch of people watching. Um, I have been going to FHL since 2014, um, and it's just a second home at this point. Uh, it, they're so caring and so loving and just um, it's such a, a cool social group on this tiny island in this tiny marine station um, and and we just have an absolute ball and it's super supportive um, and all of my friends here who uh, have been with me through thick and thin um, and stress and no stress um, and this person has taken I think a lot of the brunt of that um, we've been together since just about the beginning of my PhD and every year of my PhD I have left for about six months of the year to go up to marine station um, and she has stuck with me through that um, and uh, uh, I think it helps that you also love Friday Harbor <laughs> Um, so very grateful for that. Um, she's my uh, editor in chief of my work um, and uh, just makes me laugh constantly. And uh, uh, I, I'm, I apologize for what's about to happen. But <laughs> when you live apart from each other for six months out of the year for six years, uh, oh really <laughs> We find fun ways to keep it to keep it interesting. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> um, and she actually graduates tomorrow from SMIA, um, and we get married in less than a month. So we've got a lot going on. Yeah, thank you. I'm excited. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm happy to take questions. And if folks have questions online, please put them in the chat. We are watching. And, and I'll just remind everyone that um, there's a public session that's open. It will probably have a Such a good question. Yeah, so um, sea stars do have indeterminate growth, which essentially means um, that as long as there's lots of food and good nutrients and good uh, sort of conditions, they can keep growing. Um, it also means that they can shrink. Um, as conditions get bad, they actually start um, sort of dissolving themselves a little bit and, and reincorporating those nutrients to hold themselves over. And so what you end up with is sizes of stars that sort of grow and shrink over time. Um, whether there's a max size, it seems like they sort of slow down at some point, um, but I'm not sure that that actually sort of stops. I think it, you just run into this sort of area of, of good and bad conditions where you keep growing and shrinking over time.
Yeah, so uh, I did forget to mention all of that volume uh, is all corrected, uh, is size corrected towards total volume. So like um, the star that has is that is really low on armor is actually a, a, a decently sized star, but given its total volume, it had a low skeletal volume. Yeah. Awesome. Well, it's so fun to call it. Um, in your first project, I question, yeah. you saw that there was with your cages, which is a cool result, that yeah. when you went there, there was muscles in your cage. Why do you think predation is same along with fire than in like outer coast where you do see muscles? Do you think it's predation or maybe also integrating with tide? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't actually think that predation itself is any higher here than it is in the outer coast. But what um, I think is happening and, and has been shown in um, uh, at least one other paper, or at least suggested, is that because the temperatures are warmer here, that upper limit of the mussels is lower on the inner tidal and completely overlaps with all of their predators. Um, so the only place that they can settle down is exactly where all of their predators are. There's no sort of safe zone higher on the inner tidal that they can handle, mm. if that makes sense. Got questions in the chat. Oh yeah. Um, amid just a slew of congratulations <laughs> and love from everybody. Um, Malin Roberts has a couple of questions. Um, how fast do sea stars travel across intertidal and high tide? Could faster moving stars get more access to food? How can morphology mm. be um, impacting that? Yeah. Uh, and how might morphology and or how about yeah. <laughs> how might morphology be related to uh, different kinds of prey? Yeah, I think there's sort of a couple things that I'll address in that. Um, one is that um, it it seems like from the sort of nine species that we had that the inner the stars that are intertidal do have these sort of bigger, heavier, boxier. Um, skeletons to support themselves, which could potentially reduce speed. Um, some of the fastest stars that I know of, um, so Pycnopodia can move, Pycnopodia is a star that's about this big at full size. It's got like 28 arms. They're really um, squishy. Um, so they have completely reduced their, their body wall ossicles. And this is a star that I desperately wish we could have scanned. Um, but again, they get really large and it's hard to find those small ones. And now it's actually an endangered species. Um, so I would be heartbroken if I had to kill one to scan one. Um, but uh, these large, fast stars tend to have this uh, major reduction in body wall ossicles, um, possibly to increase their ability to go faster. Um, they also tend to be diggers. Um, so they use tube feet to move sand and dig down to get things like clams. Um, and so it, there could be something there in terms of like sort of weight, heft, flexibility of skeleton and needing that heft to be in the intertidal that slows you down. Um, so Pisaster and other intertidal stars regularly get caught out of crevices um, as the tide comes in and out, um, though I think some of that's related to whether or not they were sort of caught feeding at the time. Uh, okay. yeah. uh, you mentioned the really cool bumps on that yeah. one starfish. What? What are those? Do you think there's any reason to have bumps everywhere? Or? That particular star baffles me. Um, <laughs> I don't know why those, I, I don't really, I might have some guesses as to why you would have those bumps, but there's another very similar, somewhat closely related star that's similar in size, but doesn't, that's totally smooth, which sort of blows my hypothesis out of the water, but um, I was thinking that it might be some some way of increasing water turbulence along the skeleton. Um, these guys, sea stars in general, are prone to um, uh, using up all of the oxygen right at their um, right at their surface. So a lot of them have tissue fingers called dermal branchia um, that sort of go out and help increase. Um, uh, 
surface area for, for oxygen. Um, and so it could be that those bumps are helping to sort of move the water along, um, but that doesn't explain what's happening with the star that's completely smooth. I will say the star that is completely smooth is known as the leather star, and it has an extraordinarily thick dermis on top of all of those spines. Um, so it could have reduced those spines just because it's not using them in the same way that the rest of the stars are. It's not protective because um, I think that dermis is protective instead. So yeah, with that same star also has uh, an extraordinarily hefty, large ambulacral groove. And I also don't know why that's the case. And, and that star out of all of them, I know the least amount about their ecology. Um, uh, and there's not a ton in the, in the literature about it. So um, it could be that there's some other predator or something that they're trying to protect themselves against that just hasn't been um, described or seen. I'm not sure. More tough questions. Yeah. Uh, Lauren asks, I know sea urchins can be a photoreceptor to sea stars mm. and sea dunes too. Some of them. Um, on the tips of each of the sea star arms, they have specialized tube feet that have photoreceptors. And some of them have actually fairly, um, uh, fairly complex eyes um, that we think could be image forming um, eyes in some of the bigger predators. Awesome. Um, and then Christy asks, do any of the stars besides Terrastra have secondary depictions like spawning? Yeah. Um, so this picture here is showing off what Terraster can do, is known as the slime star. Um, if you irritate it enough, it, this starts coming out of every, every, all the whole surface. I mean, it just chunks it out kind of like hagfish do. Um, and uh, the other thing that I, that I didn't get into about the star is that they actually have two body walls. Um, so right at the base of these ossicles is the surface of the star, the way that you think of a surface of a star for all the other species. And then they have a secondary one that lays on top of these spines. Um, so when you look at the star, you don't see all of those spines happening. And that space in between um, is where a number of their related species brood um, their young. And also possibly that's where this, the slime is sort of coming from. Um, that I know of this, group I think is one of the only groups that has that sort of secondary um, defense. Oh, take it back. Um, the crown of thorns um, has uh, venomous spines. So there are examples of secondary defenses. Yep. Uh, wonderful. And then Jason Oden asks, <laughs> we came to FHL first in 2014, so did Sea Star Wasting. Yeah. I'm not blaming you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wow. We have insights regarding ecological function of high disaster from the time it was virtually missing. Oh. When Sea Star Wasting. Yeah, I mean, that was the big question. So um, with with Bob Payne's work, so, uh, sort of showing that um, without Pisaster, you have muscles that start working their way down the inner tidal. Um, that's sort of what a lot of people were expecting to see when sea star wasting came in and removed um, most of the sea stars on the West Coast. Um, and a lot of echinoderm labs just immediately went out and started surveying um, all along the coast. And for the most part um, that I'm aware of, um, that did not happen. Um, muscles were not moving down. Um, and so some folks have suggested that uh, basically other predators came in and sort of took that role. So um, Leptosterius, although much smaller, um, still goes after a lot of the same prey, just smaller versions of them. Um, and then we also have things like drilling snails um, and birds um, that may have sort of come in and, and sort of filled that functional role. Um, of predation. Um, here in the San Juans um, uh, that I know of, no one was necessarily surveying what was going on with the prey community. We didn't have, a, I think, a very good baseline beforehand. Um, uh, there's a couple data sets. Um, Ken Siebens has a really great data set, a subtitle data set. Um, they were taking pictures for years beforehand and then through sea star wasting and after. And I think that one of his students um, went through it and, and tried to look at what was going on, but I'm not sure that they saw anything spe uh, specifically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and last 
question in the chat is an easy one. Uh, Carol Stromberg is wondering if those external ventricles are made of the calcium carbonate. Yes, all of the pieces, all of the ossicles are calcium carbonate. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. Um, I was wondering if adult, I don't know if you've touched on this, I've, I've missed it, but if adult size of the different species correlates to the amount of armor that they had? It's a great question. I don't know, because uh, so far all I've scanned are the sizes that I could find, and size doesn't necessarily correlate to age, or uh, yeah, so because they can sort of grow and shrink and depending on the species. Mm -hmm. So there's a fairly good chance that some of the stars, especially the really big species that we scanned were juveniles, versus that really small star was likely an adult. Um, and so uh, I think open for anybody who wants it, I think ontogeny is a great question to ask in terms of um, what's going on with the skeletons as these stars get older. Um, there's, there's work that looks at the sort of regrowth rates of arms because sea stars can lose arms and regrow them, um, but we don't have uh, a lot of information on what's going on with the ossicles um, when you sort of first metamorphosize, metamorphose, uh, and then grow into a larger star. Um, and Leptosterius, that small star, I, I think would be a great one to work with just because it's already so small. You can start with the really tiny babies um, and scan them up to full adult size. Yeah, great question. Yes, you basically <laughs> summarized the last paragraph of most. Yeah. <laughs> I also don't want to uh, say anything about whether ontogeny through grad school increases your yeah. memory or not, but it certainly increases other kinds of skills and traits. So with that, let's thank you all.